Colossians are thinking, so take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 4. We're really going to look at verses 5 and 6, but to put them in their context, we're going to read from verse 2 through 6, Colossians 4. We're in a series called Total Grace. And when we're looking how the grace of God um, affects our, our knowledge of God, our love of God, our walk with God from beginning to end, we're not just saved by grace. We're equipped by it, we're kept by it, we're blessed by it, and we will enjoy it forever. It's grace, total grace, start to finish. And we've been identifying some elements of God's grace. We've looked at saving grace out of Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Now we looked at strengthening grace, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And now this morning we're going to look at speaking grace, the ability to communicate the gospel of God's grace graciously. And so we'll see how we can do that both this morning and uh, the next time. I'll be here next Sunday, but Harry Walls will be speaking from our men's retreat and we'll pick this up on the other side. This is going to be a two-parter. I haven't done one of those in a while and I just want to remind you I have the freedom to do that. So um, (laughs) Colossians 4, let's stand. Verses 2 through 6. Very, very interesting passage one that I actually am excited to preach over to Sundays because it speaks to your life and my life. Listen to Paul. Continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, salt seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So reads God's word and you may be seated. One of the men who influenced my life was an Irish Baptist pastor and church planter, by the name of Jim Henry. He was a friend of my father, and he became my friend. Ours was a Paul to Timothy relationship. And Jim had a passion for evangelism. And so he made it one of his goals in life never to end the day without having at least one meaningful conversation with someone without Christ about Christ. Let me say that again. He made it his goal in life to never end the day if possible without having one meaningful conversation with someone without Christ about Christ. Jim Henry considered the day lost if he got to the end of it without speaking to the lost. That's a good passion and that's a good perspective. And as we turn to Colossians chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, Paul has a similar passion. Paul has a similar perspective. He writes to the Colossians here. This is during his first imprisonment. He writes Ephesians and Philippians uh, alongside of Colossians. And as he writes to this church, he wants to encourage them to go through life with their eyes wide open to every possible opportunity to share Christ with those who are without Christ. And they're to do it in a manner that's gracious and gripping. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. Let me say this. What we have in this passage is um, the inspired words of God, and what we have is informative, transformative, apostolic guidelines to personal evangelism. It's interesting, you have a a wonderful contrast that's set up here, a complementary contrast between verses 2 through 4 and verses 5 through 6. In verses 2 through 4, the emphasis is on the teachers and preachers of the church and how the church ought to pray for them, that God would open doors for them, that they might indeed know what they ought to speak. And then you have in verses 5 to 6, this mobilizing of the whole church 
to live out their life under the lordship of Jesus Christ and to look for opportunities as life unfolds to speak for the Lord Jesus. So you've got this complementary contrast between public preaching on the part of men like Paul and personal evangelism on the part of everyone in the church. Some are called to the first and ought to be prayed for by all, but all are called to the second. Evangelism's not the preserve of a select few, but the duty of the whole church. You read in Acts 8 verse 4, when the church was scattered, it says they went everywhere teaching or preaching the word. Someone has translated that gossiping the gospel. That's good. What a wonderful picture. The church everywhere in all areas and facets of life gossiping the gospel. That's what you've got here in Colossians 4 verses 5 through 6. Biblically speaking, the harvest of souls is to be handpicked most of the time. We're, we're thankful for the Pauls and the Peters and the Johns, for our pastors and evangelists who preach the word in direct evangelism. But we're also thankful for the army of the anonymous, the body of Christ, in a line at Starbucks, at a checkout at Walmart, on the sports field on a Saturday, hanging over the fence with your neighbor on a Monday, gossiping the gospel. In fact, most people will be saved by that method. I, I love a quote I came across this week by Alexander McLaren, a great English expositor of a former generation. He says this, It is better for most of us to fish with the rod than with the net, to angle for single souls rather than to try and enclose a multitude at once. Preaching to a congregation has its place and value, but private and personal talk, honestly and wisely done, with the, will affect more than most eloquent preaching. That's an interesting statement from one of the most eloquent preachers in England at the time. And that's what we have here. We've got this complementary contrast. We thank God and we pray for those men called and gifted to be preachers, teachers, and evangelists. Some are called to that. But we thank God for the church mobilized who's out gossiping the gospel, hand-picking souls for Jesus Christ. Here's another thing just by way of introduction. This is a unique passage we're about to look at. That's why as I got into it and studied it and all kinds of things started to open up to my understanding, I said, I got to go a couple of weeks on this because the material is good. Number two, it's unique and unusual. Why would I say that? Because elsewhere in the New Testament, you have passages that address what I would call a theology of evangelism. But here we have a passage that addresses a methodology of evangelism. Elsewhere in the New Testament, you're told what evangelism is and why you should do it. The what and the why are answered. Here, the how is answered. How you're to do it. This is unique. Don't miss it. This is a practicum on how you and I are to influence and impact people around us with the gospel. And we're always in search for answers for that, aren't we? Just this past week when we were uh, on a cruise, I, I read a book on the grace of God by Bran Edwards, an English pastor, and throughout the book, he, he drew lessons from the life of John Newton, famous for amazing grace. And in the book, he talks about how in 1783, John Newton, I converted ex-slave trader now working for the abolition of slavery across the British Empire. Now I'm ministering the Church of England. He, he gets together with several pastors, and they form in 1783 what's called the Eclectic Society. This is a group of pastors who would just meet and talk about ministry, talk about life, talk about how to grow their church, how to do a better job in evangelism and discipleship and counseling. And what I was interested in, as Brian Edwards communicates, that in December 1795, 
If you read John Newton's diary, you'll realize that the discussion on that particular day in the eclectic society was this, quote, how may we best introduce religious conversation in company? That's two centuries ago, but sounds very real, doesn't it? How do you get the gospel across to your family, to your friends, to your workmates, to your school buddies? How do you interject Christ into public conversation? And you know what? Back in those days, evangelicals were a minority. They weren't accepted within society. And John Newton goes on to talk about how he was, uh, he was limited in his invitations socially. But even when he was at a dinner party or in the company of just people within the culture, he found it very hard to break in with the gospel. And he just wants to know, hey, guys, can you help me? How do we do a better job at conversing about Christ? Well, here we have before us a wonderful passage on how we can do that. We know what evangelism is, and we know why we ought to do it, but I'll tell you what I struggle at and what you struggle at is how, how to be effective in it. So let's look at this passage. Three things I want to say is our, our evangelism ought to be tactful, we ought to be wise in how we conduct ourselves before the outsider. It ought to be thoughtful. We ought to be open to every opportunity that's presented to us. And it ought to be tasteful. We ought to speak with grace, seasoned with salt. That whole image is, we ought to flavor our conversation. We need to be true to the gospel, but we need to be compelling and gripping and appealing in our appeal. Great stuff. So we have we want to look at this tactful, thoughtful, tasteful. Now, let me just, uh, by the way, back up into the text in its context. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you'll see that this is part of a section in this letter that addresses how you and I live out the lordship of Christ in everyday life. The, the, the new man, the new woman in Jesus Christ has a certain calling they're to develop a certain con character, and they're to behave in a certain way. And Paul's been talking about that almost at the beginning of chapter 3. But when you get to verse 18 and following, he'll talk about all uh, aspects and avenues of life, private life, prayer life, public life, personal life. He addresses all those issues and how the new man and the new woman in Christ ought to behave themselves. And so invariably, since you're getting down to the practical matters of living out the lordship of Christ, invariably you're going to have to address the issue of the church in the world. Okay? The church in the world. <laughs> Twelve o'clock comes every Sunday morning, and we're back to the business of living the church is gathered. Now the church is scattered. How are we to behave to those outside? Paul gives us a means of doing that. Remember, this is part of our series on total grace. We've looked at saving grace. We've looked at strengthening grace. And now we're looking at speaking grace. We we're to speak with grace. We're to be gracious in how we speak and present the gospel of God's grace. We have experienced grace, and we ought to express it graciously. So let's look at the first thought. That's all we're going to cover this morning. We've got the Lord's table, and we want to be mindful of that. So remember, number one, be tactful. Be tactful. This is how you and I are to evangelize. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. That's our first thought stands by itself. Conduct yourself smartly. Be smart in how you address your neighbor, how you speak to your workmate, how you address a, a council a member or a, a, a member of our, our um, political establishment. Be, be careful. Be wise. Be smart. Plain and simple. Act with tact. Act with tact. That's a little memorable phrase to those who are outside. This is a thought that has governed Paul's thinking elsewhere. 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Moreover, speaking of the elder, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. 
lest he fall in reproach in the snare of the devil. What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and, and, and verse 12, where again he addresses the, this issue of how you and I ought to behave toward the unbeliever. What do we read actually backing up into verse 11? You need to aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your own hands as we have commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. We've got to guard our testimony to the outsider, the man or woman outside of Christ. We've got to behave smartly and we've got to behave properly in their presence. We've got to act wisely. Now, the, the theme of wisdom is threaded throughout this letter. Paul began by praying that the Colossians would be filled with spiritual wisdom, chapter 1, verse 9. He, he characterizes his own ministry in chapter 2, 1, verse 28, with wisdom. He speaks about how Christ is the fulfillment of wisdom, chapter 2, verse 3. He, he warns that some wisdom is fake and false wisdom when it comes from false teachers in chapter 2, verse 23. And then he admonishes the church to uh, be wise in how they act with one another. Wisdom is a theme throughout this passage. And let me tell you, I think when he thinks about wisdom, he's got a proverbial idea of it. Back in the book of Proverbs, wisdom spoke of an aptitude to act skillfully. An aptitude to act skillfully. And the book of Proverbs is very clear in distinguishing between knowledge and wisdom between education and wisdom. If I can simplify it for you, uh, knowledge or education is the acquisition of facts and what's knowable. But wisdom is the application of those facts to life. <laughs> the ability to turn the corner and take what you know and apply it to what you're facing to get a feel for the moment you're in, <laughs> to, to act appropriately when you come to the end of the rule book and no one can tell you what to do. You've got to decide what to do and it must be informed by wisdom. I, I like what one writer said. The dif difference between knowledge and wisdom is this. Knowledge tells you that a tomato, tomato, is a fruit. <laughs> it's a fruit. A tomato is a fruit. But wisdom tells you it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. <laughs> that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Okay? And that's what we're at here. Walk wisely, smartly, adeptly to the outsider. Be careful. Be tactful. Now, for the 15 minutes that remains around about that, I'm going to answer three questions about wisdom in relation to the outsider. You know, the, 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 you know we're, we're, the, that very idea doesn't sit well with many of us. We're, we've, we're, we've kind of bent so much the whole idea of inclusivism in our culture. The whole idea of outsider sounds wrong, but a, an outsider biblically is someone who's without God in the world and without hope. They're without Christ. They're outside the covenant. They're outside the church. And we've got to, as we meet them, act wisely toward them. We want the outsiders to become insiders. The church should never be a holy huddle. The church is not about protecting Christian families or existing for own, simply for own mutual benefit. The church exists so that outsiders will become insiders as we walk wisely before them and speak with grace, seasoned with salt. So who, what, and when? Who, what, and when? What, what wisdom do we need to apply when it comes to who? Well, generally speaking, we're to speak the gospel to anyone outside of Christ, just flat out. There's not a person you haven't met, regardless of who they are, how they look, 
what they believe. There's not a person you'll meet as a Christian who you shouldn't, given the opportunity, share the gospel with. They're all candidates for salvation. For in Christ, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Gentile nor Jew. The appeal of the gospel is inclusive. It throws its hands around all the outsiders. All the outsiders are candidates to become insiders. Now, here's where wisdom comes in. We're all too aware from the parable of the sower of the seed in Matthew 13 that not everyone listens equally. And we need wisdom and discernment because Jesus does warn us as we desire to share the gospel with everyone, there are occasions when you don't or you can't may be a better way to put it. What about Matthew 7, verse 6? Don't give holy things to dogs and don't cast your pearl before swine. Read 2 Timothy as we did in our main study, and Timothy's told to avoid getting drawn in to unprofitable conversations that are focused on quarreling and questions that are dead ends in themselves. And so we're told to be discerning. Sometimes we need to be bold and forthright, but, in, but at other times, given the hostility and the posture of those to whom we're speaking, we need to keep our mouths shut because it's unprofitable. We need to walk with wisdom when it comes to who. As Ecclesiastes teaches us, doesn't it? There is a time to speak and there is a time to keep silent. And that's even true in evangelism. Now, let me say this as a footnote. Lest some of you take that and do something with it I don't want you to do. That's not the same as you deciding, I don't like him, so I'm not going to share the gospel with him. <laughs> That's not the same thing. Not the same as not speaking to people we don't like. God forbid that any one of us would become an arbiter of who gets to hear the gospel. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Although wisdom would remind us it would be the exception rather than the rule not to cast our pearl before swine or give holy things to those that simply want to mock it. Secondly, what about what? Who, what? We need wisdom as to who we're to speak to and we need wisdom as to what we're to say given the opportunity. Now, I'm not speaking here about the content of the gospel. When I speak about what are we to say, we know what we ought to say at some point, we got to get everybody to the foot of the cross. At some point, we've got to talk about repentance and faith and how Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and the third day He rose again. That's the gospel. And so the question of what is not there. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby they can be saved. We've got to get them to Jesus and get Jesus to them. Full stop. That's not what we're talking about here. When I ask the question, what, in relation to wisdom in personal evangelism, it would be this, um, how can we engage them so that we might talk to them about Jesus? How do we um, clearly and compellingly communicate the gospel to them? Look at verse 6 of our passage. Let your speech Always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Seems to me the implication of that text is that you're to treat every person as an individual. This is not mass evangelism with a preacher, a pulpit, and a platform, and a large crowd like this. This is personal evangelism. This is treating someone as an individual this is the best way to bring people to the cross. I want to say this, and, 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 I, and I thank God how he has used the a tracks like the Roman road that was put out by Campus Crusade many years ago. Excellent, I've used it. But I want to remind myself, you cannot nor should you force everybody down the Roman's road. You need to be smarter than that. 
You can't have a cookie-cutter approach to evangelism. There isn't a way or an approach or a method that covers everybody or should be used on everybody. Because we're told here, you need to know how you ought to answer everyone. You need wisdom, not only on the who, but the what. You know this. Some people have intellectual questions about the Christian faith that you need to address, the existence of God, the presence of evil. Some people have emotional hang-ups. They're hurt. They're carrying wounds. Some of them have been inflicted on them in the name of Christ. Some people are, are prisoners to sinful habits and bondages and addictions, and they can't see themselves past it. They're all different. You can't throw one blanket over them all. No, you need to be wiser than that. What damage is done sometimes to the cause of Christ because we ignorantly and arrogantly address people without wisdom. We need to learn how to address everyone as we ought. I like what Sam Storms says in his commentary on Colossians, of course there is but one Savior, and his name is Jesus, but each person is also at a different stage of life, facing a unique set of trials and troubles, each with varying degrees of understanding of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. In some, be adept to adopt, adopt, sorry, and pray that the Spirit would awaken all hearts to see and celebrate the mystery of Christ. I like, so I'll give you a little phrase earlier, just make stuff memorable, act with tact. Here's another little phrase from Sam Storms, be adept to adopt, you know? Ch change your game plan when you're confronted with a given situation. Uh, have, have a number of, you know, uh, weapons in your arsenal, uh, a number of answers uh, in your mind. Can I say this? Personal evangelism must be personal. Just saying. Personal evangelism must be personal. Be ready to give a, an answer to, to everyone as you ought to speak. It seems to be inference that, you know what? There's some things that are inappropriate at a given time in the evangelistic encounter. In fact, I, I, I pulled down a book off my shelf. I love this book. It's called Teach as Jesus Taught by Roy Zook of Dallas Theological Seminary. It's out of print now, but if you're a preacher or a teacher, get your hands on it. There's two books he wrote, Teach as Jesus Taught and Teach as Paul Taught. And he looks at their methodology of teaching. And, and as I looked at it, okay, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's something in there about how Jesus modeled this. Certainly is the case. You, you can read your Gospels. I don't need to tell you this morning. Did Jesus treat people as individuals? Did he have the same message for Zacchaeus as he had for the woman caught in adultery? No. He treated with people with sensitivity and spontaneity and variety. In fact, I was surprised to realize, according to this book, almost half of Jesus' encounters were his reaction to something someone else said to him. And then he grabs that, he hooks onto that, and he does something with it. Seems to me Jesus modeled this, where he knew how he ought to answer to each man. I like the story I've told you before of the American tourist who got lost among the country lanes of Ireland, and he stopped his rental car, and he asked one of the locals for directions to Dublin, to which the old guy replied, well, if I was going to Dublin, I wouldn't start here. Well, of course he wouldn't start there. You know where to go. The guy's lost. And here's the point. So are your friends and family. And you need to meet them where they are. And you need to pray for wisdom to move them forward to the cross. Here's the last thought as we wrap up. When, who, what, when. This is great. Very challenging, by the way. I think you're, you're, some things in your mind is going to be turned upside down with this final thought. When? When are you to speak in personal evangelism? 
Here's the answer. When the opportunity lends itself. When the opportunity lends itself. Walk in wisdom towards who are outside, redeeming the time. We'll look at that the next time. Bind up the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with self, that you may know how you ought to. Does it say speak? No, it says answer. Each one. So the import and the implication of this critical text on evangelism for the church is that for the most part, our evangelism in the normal course of things is more responsive than direct. More responsive than direct. Here's the way I think the New Testament casts the idea of evangelism most of the time. Hopefully, as you and I walk wisely, as our lives become an attraction, Titus 2.10, right? As we adorn the doctrine, ladies, the word adorn there is to beautify. It's the word that gives us our English word cosmetics. As you and I beautify the gospel or the doctrine of God by the way we live, people are attracted. So here's how it goes. Hopefully, as Christians walk wisely before the outside world and they see the way we live and the way we love and the way we laugh, it raises questions. They see something they don't see elsewhere. They encounter something they want. They're made jealous of the peace and significance and purpose and passion with which Christians live. And so as they're confronted by us walking before them in an attractive manner, they go, hold on a minute, you're different. And at that point, the bell rings. Okay, you're ready to give an answer to each man. Now you're responding to a gospel opportunity. This is evangelism that grows out of authentic discipleship. Write that down. Evangelism grows out of authentic discipleship. This is not forced. And this is not manipulative evangelism. This is evangelism in the course of life, everyday discipleship. The people being addressed in these verses are the church at large, not preachers in particular. Paul Preachers, evangelists are being addressed in verses 2 through 4. But the rest of the church, who are not as gifted in this area, you never want to try and exercise something you're not gifted in. So don't try and preach at people when you're not called to preach. But we're all called to respond to opportunities, hopefully the holiness and happiness of our lives create. So you have direct evangelism going on through preachers, but you've got responsive evangelism going on for the most part, most of the time, by the church. In fact, I want, you to, I want to prove this thesis to you. I stole it from Dick Lucas in his commentary in Colossians. It's excellent. Maybe steal is not the right word for a Christian. I borrowed it. <laughs> Here's what he said. He says, notice how verse 4 ends. Remember, this is Paul asking them to pray for him. And he says, that, that, that I might know what I ought to speak. That's direct evangelism. Pray that when a door opens, I'll be as bold as a lion to preach the gospel. And that will be your Greg Laurie's and your Billy Graham's in some manner in terms of evangelism. But I want you to notice when he speaks to the general church, Look at the end of verse 4. Pray that you might know how to answer. See, speaking is direct. Answering is responsive. And I think Dick Lucas is right. In fact, I'll, I'll quote him and wrap this up. They are to pray for the apostle that he might make the gospel known as he ought to speak. He in turn gives them sound advice so that they may know how they ought to answer. We may describe this difference by saying that while the apostle looks for many opportunities for direct evangelism and teaching, the typical Christian in Colossae is to look for many opportunities for responsive evangelism. 
If this distinction is a correct one, it immediately commends itself with sanity and realism. He's right. So many Christians have been burdened, made to feel unduly guilty because they go, I can't preach like the pastor. I can't evangelize like this person. I don't have that ability. That's right. You don't have that ability. Don't try and be that. But look for everyday opportunities to gossip the gospel and how you might answer the opportunities that come your way. You don't have to force them. You don't have to unduly create them. You don't have to bully your way into a conversation. Listen to what Dick Lucas says. It's obvious what strains this removes from conscientious Christians. The pressure to raise certain topics and reach certain people can make it difficult to live or talk normally. You ever watch someone do evangelism? It just doesn't seem normal. Because it's, it isn't normal. It's forced, manipulative. Not the calling of the church as the mass. In any case, we go to the office to work, not to evangelize. But by being ready and willing to respond, the way is open to a more serene and successful approach to each day's opportunities. He's right. Is that not helpful this morning? Hey, God's called you to preach, pastor, and others to preach. I want to pray for you that God gives you doors for the radio and everything else. That's, that's your calling. We're going to stand behind that. We're going to pray for it, support that. That's your calling. But pastor, pray that I might walk wisely, smartly, adeptly, in the normal course of things with my neighbor, my workmates, those I play sports with, those I go to the movies with, whatever, wherever life takes you and you can maintain your testimony, you look for opportunities whereby, hopefully by the way you live and speak, they go, hey, can I ask you a question? And you go, thank you, Lord, and I give me the wisdom now to share the gospel in a gracious, gripping manner. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for our time in the Word this morning. Help us to be the everyday church. Help us to go about our lives adorning the gospel, walking wisely. Help us to be smart and not foolish in the way we present Christ and share the gospel. Help us to redeem the time. Help us to go through the day like Jim Henry asking you to provide us an opportunity to have at least one meaningful conversation with someone about Jesus. Help us to remember what we've heard at Kindred University, our counseling classes, our Sunday morning services, so that as we take the truth preached, we can use it to answer appropriately each man as is fit. Lord, on the one hand, we thank you there's some relief in this this morning where we don't need to be a Billy Graham. We don't need to be like our pastors in preaching. But on the other hand, there is a big responsibility to fish with the rod, to look for the individual and the God-given opportunity. For we pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, look, as we come to the...